Good morning, Oakland Baptist. It's good to see all of you this morning. I hope everybody had a Merry Christmas. Uh, like normal, we're going to start off with a good handful of announcements. Um, there, I'm reading just about everything that's in here this uh, this week. So if you don't, or you miss something I say, it's right there in your bulletin, and we got plenty of them sitting outside, so you can grab one of them. Uh, the Lottie Moon Christmas offering for international missions run through, runs through December, so this will be the last week that that is available. So if you're looking to give specifically towards Lottie Moon, um, that needs that should happen sometime in the next couple of days. Uh, Wednesday evening service will look. Uh, just like normal, prayer meeting will start at 6.15, youth and children will start at 6.15, and choir practice will be at 7.15. Um, on, on this Wednesday beforehand, though, we're going to be having a New Year's dinner. That's going to be starting at 5.30 down in the fellowship hall with some, uh, some country hams and black eyed peas and some greens will be served. Um, please sign up today in the main vestibule uh, so, so we know about how much food to prepare. There looks like a solid list of folks coming, uh, so get your name written down, how many folks you got coming with you and all of that. Good stuff. Um, this Wednesday, our college ministry and I, will, we're going to be heading to uh, Louisville, Kentucky. Um, we're leaving at like 5 a.m. on Wednesday. Um, so be praying for us as we're traveling that way. Be praying that the, uh, the conference goes well and that um, the Lord moves, um, not just with us, but with, with the, the whole gathering um, there. Uh, speaking of that conference, if you are going to that, we're going to have a brief meeting in the fellowship hall right after service. It literally will be like 10 minutes or less. Um, so we just want to talk over some final plans for all of that. Uh, 2022 offering envelopes are available in the main vestibule. Uh, p- please feel free to take a box and write your name and box number on the sign-up sheet. Uh, baptism service will be next Sunday during our morning worship service. Uh, please contact Pastor Lee if you are a candidate for baptism. Uh, there will be a deacons meeting on Monday, January 3rd at 7 p.m. The Sunday following that, there will be a remembrance service on January 9th. Uh, we're going to take some time during that morning service just to remember those uh, from the Oakland family who went to be with the Lord during 2021. Uh, there will be a church council meeting on Monday, January 10th. And then our quarterly business meeting will be Sunday, January 23rd. There will be covered dish dinner beforehand like normal um, at 6 p.m. And then the last thing I have for you, next Sunday we're going to begin our Bible study working through Ephesians on Sunday nights at 7 o'clock. Um, so next Sunday is January 2nd, so if you're looking to come to that, that is for anybody and everybody. There's no sign up because there's, we're just going through the Bible. Um, so just feel free to come, whoever you want to, uh, whoever you want to bring. Um, like I said, that'll be from 7 to 8. You can come at 6.30. Um, that's when the kids will be leaving from Sunday night. Get right. If, so feel free to just come and uh, have a time of fellowship beforehand. Um, but that'll, like I said, that'll be next uh, Sunday at 7 p.m. Um, if you haven't done so yet, please make your way back down this hallway and check the mailbox. Um, they are stuffed. I saw plenty of people that were checking them this morning. Uh, but they are packed pretty full, so if you haven't made your way back there to check that, please do so just so you can make sure you got any uh, cards from anybody that you may have missed in your mail that they dropped off here. But I believe that's all of the announcements that I have for you this morning. Um, but it's good to see you all this morning. Uh, if you're a visitor with us, we just want to say thank you. Um, if you look in the back of the pew in front of you, we have a Connect card in there that we'd love for you to take and fill out just so that we can get to know some information about you, how you found out about us, and uh, just so that we can get in contact with you uh, after this. Um, but I believe that's all that I have for us. And so I'm going to ask uh, Pastor Lee if he'll come in prayer. And one last thing uh, as well. Um, those poinsettias, uh, if you were one that placed those there, uh, we would love for you to take that home with you. Um, after service today, if you feel so inclined, so you can just come on up here and take your pick. Um, you get the prettiest one if you show up is, uh, after the benediction today. So your deacon of the week is Jimmy Browder, so as soon as Jimmy says amen, the second time this morning, don't come do it after the offertory prayer. That'd be real awkward for you. Um, why don't you wait till the end of service today, and we'd love for you to take your points at home with you. Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer uh, this morning. Our God and our Father, we are... We're grateful folks. God, we we thank you, Lord. Father, for all the many blessings, Lord, and certainly the ones that we have experienced during this season. God, we thank you for the Advent season and the time that we have set aside, Lord, for the past uh, four weeks, longer than that even, Lord, um, as we uh, anticipated Christmas. God, as we looked at the, at the hope and the joy and the peace and the love, God, that we have in Christ. Father, that we now possess each of those things, Lord. God, because we have come to know him through faith. Father, we thank you.
God, for the day which we celebrated yesterday, which we all, as believers, continue to celebrate, God, the incarnation, the fact that you sent your son to this earth. Being fully God, he became also fully man, that he put on flesh. God, that he might live a perfect life, Lord, and, and die a death on a cross. God, that I might have eternal life, that I might have joy everlasting. Father, we've gathered in this place this morning, Lord, fewer of us than normal. But God, we seek still this morning, God, to, to, to render to you your proper worship, to render to you praise, God, for who you are and for what you've done. And so, God, this morning, as we prepare for worship, Lord, we pray, God, in this moment that you might prepare each of our hearts, Father, to give to you worship, but also to receive what you have for us this morning. Lord, may you be big in this place. May, may we sing these songs that we sing this morning, God, with cheerful hearts and, and cheerful faces, God, knowing, God, what you have done and what you continue to do in our lives, Jesus, and as you continue to intercede on our behalf. Father, we love you and we praise you. We thank you for the joy of worship. We ask these things in Christ's name and for his sake. Amen. Well, amen. If you would, we're going to sing a couple of hymns this morning to begin um, our service. And we're going to begin this morning with number 87. We're going to sing verses 1, 2, and 4 of Joy to the World. Why don't you stand with us and sing? Take a moment and greet your neighbor. Make your way back to your seats. Let's sing all three verses of To God Be the Glory together. Yeah. 
Let us pray. Dear Lord, thank you for allowing us to come to your house today and worship you. Uh, we're thankful for the blessings that you have bestowed upon us. Let us take this time to uh, give back and bless the church and be able to bless our communities, Lord, as we give. We thank you for this in your name. Amen. <laughs>
time, uh, we're going to move back out of our Advent emphasis. Advent is uh, over for 2021, and so we'll move back this portion of our service uh, to our scripture reading. The next several weeks, uh, we'll have someone come and read to us from the book of Hebrews. And Brother Paul Beek is going to come this morning, and he's going to read Hebrews chapter 1 for us. Uh, if you'd like to prepare to read along with him, uh, you can certainly do that at this time, be turning to Hebrews chapter 1. God's word to us today, to the letter to the Hebrews. God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers and the prophets in many portions, in many ways, in these last days has spoken to us in his son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world. And he is the radiance of his glory and the exact representation of his nature and upholds all things by the word of his power. When he had made purification of sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much better than the angels, as he inherited a more excellent name than they. For to which of the angels did he ever say, You are my son, today I have begotten you. And today I will be a father to him, and he shall be a son to me. And when he again brings the firstborn into the world, he says, And let all the angels of God worship him. And the angels, he says, who makes his angels winds and his ministers a flame of fire? But of the Son, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. And the righteous scepter is the scepter of his kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness above your companions. And you, Lord, in the beginning laid the foundation of the earth. And the heavens are the works of your hands. They will perish, but you will remain. And they will all become like a garment. And like a mantle, you will roll them up. Like a garment, they will also be changed. But you are the same, and your years will not come to an end. But to which of the angels has he ever said, Sit at my right hand until I make the enemies a footstool for your feet? Are they not all ministering spirits sent out to render service for the sake of those who inherit salvation? I continue in worship for just a brief moment uh, before we take time to listen to the word of God.
God, we want to come before you right now as we go to step into a time to listen to the teaching of your word. And God, I ask and I pray that that is the thought running through our mind, that that is the cry of our heart, that God, you are so great and that you are so glorious and that you are so magnificent that right now we are completely and totally, totally dedicating everything that we have to you. Let every thought that goes through our mind be of you. Let every desire of our heart be you. God, let our attention be totally focused on you. God, let us acknowledge and understand that you are so glorious and so magnificent that we have gathered right here for worship. And that doesn't stop because we're sitting and listening to a teaching, but God, that that continues because we are chasing after you and you alone. God, speak through Lee this morning. God, if he goes to say things that are not of you or not from you, make him mute. But God, use your servant mightily this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, if you will, turn with me to John chapter 1. Uh, if you have been with us for the last month, with the exception of uh, Friday night, uh, I brought a word from... Uh, from Mark 5, 19 uh, on Friday night, if you were not able to be with us, that was where we were. But other than that, over the past month, we have been in John's gospel. We've been going through what is known as the prologue of that gospel uh, through verses 1 through 18. And if you're new with us this morning, or perhaps uh, you've got an, uh, not a great memory, um, I'll refresh your memory just a moment, just so we're all on the same sheet of music this morning. Uh, on the first Sunday of Advent, that would have been the Sunday after Thanksgiving, uh, we looked at the truth that Jesus Christ, the Word, that the Word was with the Father in the beginning, that He was with God and that He was God, that Jesus Christ was not a created being, despite what, what some denominations or some other uh, religions might teach, that Jesus Christ was not a created being, that He was not created by the Father, that God has always been a triune God. It has always been God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit from the beginning of time, he has existed in those three distinct persons. On the second Sunday of Advent, we looked at the truth that life and light are found within Jesus. Uh, we looked at how the light of Christ uh, has overcome the darkness within us if we are Christians. On the third Sunday of Advent, we had our, our Christmas cantata and our, and our choir and Miss Jean leading them. They did a wonderful job with that. And on the fourth Sunday of Advent, we looked at the need for witnesses. That was last Sunday. And we look, learned that, that how it is that we can be good witnesses like John the Baptist. And if you're one of those great theological minds, you might be wondering, because uh, I had attempted, I told you this in the beginning of Advent, that I wanted to help us by using this passage, using John 1, verses 1 to 18, that I wanted to help us to create somewhat of a theology of Christmas, right? A theology is not just for seminary students, it's not just for pastors and theologians and, and those sorts of things. Everyone is a theologian. Everyone is a theologian because theology is simply the study of God. 
And so everybody, that being the case, is a theologian. And you great theological minds, those of you that love deep doctrine, you might have been thinking, well, Lee, last week's sermon was not very theological. It was not necessarily uh, that deep. You didn't mention a lot of doctrine. And to you, I would simply say this. Any doctrine or any theology which does not lead you to what we talked about last week, sacrificing for Christ and being a faithful witness for Christ, if it does not focus on those things, it is a system of theology that you need to run from. And so now the last candle has been lit. Advent and Christmas 2021, um, unless you're one of the ones that celebrates those 12 days of Christmas and not by the giving of all of the birds and that sort of thing. I heard somebody actually the other day point out the fact that do you realize that on those 12 days of Christmas and all of those gifts that were being given, did you realize that like six of the first seven given were birds? And so I love birds, so that might would be okay for me. But I heard a, a joke the other day that spoke of the fact that, uh, man, if you hate birds and your true love gives to you birds for the first four days of Christmas, you're not going to be real happy. But then five, day five rolls around and you get what? Five golden rings, and you might be pretty happy about that, right? And then day six, what comes? More birds. <laughs> That's funny, isn't it? But anyway, Advent and Christmas 2021, for the most part, are over for us, with the exception of our trees still up and, and all of those sorts of things. And we come to the last few verses of the prologue of John chapter 1, which begins with these beautiful, beautiful words. Listen to these words from verse 14. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as the only son from the Father, full of grace and truth. And I'll have three points for you this morning, and we're going to have some sub points under each of those. And the majority of them are going to come from this verse that we will go through verses at verse 18 this morning. Number one, the word became flesh. The word became flesh. The, the invisible became visible. When Jesus came to be born. Jesus Christ was, was born of a virgin. And again, we must remember that. We have got to ingrain that into ourselves. Uh, because we care what God's word has to say. Not what tradition has to say. Not what other some denominations or religions have to teach. But we must remember that. Yes, though Jesus Christ was born of a virgin. We must remember that he did not come into being. At the moment that he was conceived of the Holy Spirit. He did not come into being at that moment. Human life, listen. Human life begins conception. I will argue that to my death. Human life begins at conception. Jesus' human life began at conception, but his being did not begin at, con at conception. He was with the Father in the beginning, as we have already studied. Before Jesus came to be born of the Virgin Mary, he already existed. He was already fully God, and by taking on flesh, he became also fully man. Paul says in Colossians 2, 9, for in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. And so that being so, Jesus was able to live a life free from sin while also being fully man. And we know some things based upon that. We know that by putting on flesh and by becoming man, it enabled him to die for us. If he had not become man, he would not be able to die for us. He possessed during that time a human mind and a human heart which enabled him to, to feel what we feel. We, we learn from his word that he was able to feel sorrow, that he was able to feel joy, and he was able to feel temptation. Hebrews 4.15, folks, it's such a comfort for us when we're going through hard times. It's one of my personal favorite verses to look at uh, when I might be struggling with something. Listen, we do not have a high priest, it says, who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. It says, but one who in every respect, in every way, has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. He lived a life in the same world in which we live, folks, for the most part. He, he was born a baby. He grew up as a boy. He, looked, he grew up and he, and he learned a trade. He had friends. He had neighbors. He truly lived as we lived. And so he has set an example for us of how to live as well, though we will certainly fall short. And so I think you could basically sum it up like this, uh, that Jesus came maybe for, 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 for uh, you can boil it down maybe to these three reasons, I guess. Uh, the, the three reasons that the word became flesh, you might say this, to die for us, uh, to sympathize with us, uh, to be an example uh, for us. Number one this morning, the word became flesh. I'm going to spend a little bit longer in number two. Number two, the word dwelt among us. The word dwelt among us. Jesus didn't only become flesh, but he dwelt among us. 
Now, the wording used there as the Holy Spirit directs the, the writing of the Apostle John uh, it, it, it is the verb form of the Greek word for tabernacle. That word for, for, for dwelt right there, John took the, the word for, for tabernacle and he turned it into a verb. So it basically, literally, what it literally translates right here is this, the word tabernacled among us. Now, now if, you don't, you know, if you're not, a, uh, you don't even have to be a biblical scholar necessarily, but if you've never read the Bible, you might not have any, uh, that might make no sense to you whatsoever. But hopefully I'll help to make sense of that this morning. Here's the thing. There can be no doubt whatsoever that God is intending to remind us through his servant John uh, of the Exodus when, when it was that he dwelt with the Israelites in the tabernacle. Or, or the tent of meeting there at that time, it's also called. You, you'll remember that as the Israelites were traveling, that their tabernacle, that it moved along with them. And, and nearly, listen, everything about the tabernacle, it symbolizes the Word being made flesh. It symbolizes Jesus Christ. Nearly every single thing about that tabernacle, it symbolizes Jesus Christ coming into this world to save us from our sins. There's at least ten examples of that, and I'm not going to give you all ten this morning. I'll just point out a few, because we don't need all ten to understand this. Uh, and we have a hard time remembering ten things, so I'll just give you a few of them. First, the tabernacle was temporary. The tabernacle was temporary. It was a tent. It was meant to be moved from place to place as the Israelites are traveling in the wilderness. Now, the temple of Solomon that would later be built, that was a more permanent structure. But the tabernacle, as the Israelites traveled throughout the wilderness, it, it was temporary. Uh, and so it was with Jesus' time on this earth. Uh, you might say that, that Jesus pitched his tent on this earth for 33 years. And he didn't stay in one place. Matthew 8, 20 tells us this. It says, uh, foxes have holes. The birds of the air uh, have nests, but the, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. You know, folks, the, the same is true uh, for each of us who are born again. Well, look, we're just passing through on our way to the, to the promised land. A second this morning, a second way uh, that the tabernacle points uh, to Jesus, that it, it's, the tabernacle was humble and it was unattractive. Now, some of you at home, you might have these pictures of a, uh, a very handsome-looking Jesus. Um, Blonde-haired, blue-eyed, brown-haired, brown, whatever in the world it is that you have hanging on your wall uh, at home or the little statue you have at home. The, the Bible actually tells us that Jesus wasn't much to look at. I suppose that might be one of the ways that uh, I'm being conformed to the image of the sun every day. I'm not sure, but... Look, the, the, the Temple of Solomon later, it would be very costly, and that would be very beautiful. But look, the tabernacle that traveled with the Israelites in the wilderness, it wasn't much to look at. It, it was made of plain old boards and plain old skins. The, the same is true of Christ. Isaiah 53, 12, or 53, 2, rather, uh, prophesied this. It says he would have no former majesty. No former majesty that we should look at him, and no beauty that we should desire him. Third, the tabernacle was at the very center of Israel's camp. Uh, you'll remember this as you read uh, through the book of Numbers. Numbers 2.17 uh, says this, that the tent of meeting, that it shall set out with the camp of the Levites in the midst of the camps. And so the various tribes of Israel, they would, they would camp all around the tabernacle and the Lord would be in the center. And in that same way, folks, Jesus must always be the very center of everything that we do. He must. He, he must be the center of everything that we believe. He, he must be the center of our love. He must be the center of our devotion. He must be the center of our lives. Everything that we do must be to the end of His glory. Everything that we do is supposed to be for God. And if there's any situation in our lives or any area of our lives where we're not submitted to Him or where we're not doing the very thing that we're doing for Him and His glory alone, we're wrong. You know, we love at this time of year... Uh, during the Christmas season, and, and I'm probably guilty of it as well. Um, very likely, there will be a sermon that speaks of Mary and Joseph trying to go and find somewhere uh, um, to, uh, for Jesus to be born, and we, uh, we, we hear, you know, there, there's no place for him in the inn, right? And undoubtedly, a preacher or a well-meaning Christian, that sort of thing, I don't mean, this is not malicious or anything, uh, they'll, they'll preach a sermon or they'll issue an invitation to make room for Jesus in your heart. Look, Jesus doesn't want just a little bit of room in your heart. That's not what the scriptures teach. What is the greatest commandment? That we love God with what? 
all our heart, all our soul, all our mind, all our strength. God does not want a little piece of your heart. He's not interested in just a little tiny little piece of your heart. Wherever you can find room over here for your, you got your love of this, love of this, love of this, love of this. He doesn't want that little speck down there in the corner. He wants all of it. He wants all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. Look, don't make room for Jesus. Submit your life to Jesus. Everything that you have, everything that you are, submit it to Jesus Christ. Next, the, 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 the tabernacle was the place where, where God would meet with men. When God was given to Moses instructions regarding the, the making of that tabernacle and his furniture, he says in Exodus chapter 25, and you shall put the mercy seat on top of the ark. And in the ark you shall put the testimony that I shall give you. And then it says, God says this, there I will meet with you. There I will meet with you. Look, in that same way, Jesus is the meeting place between God and man. Jesus Christ is the meeting place between God and man. Jesus says, John 14, 6, no one, no one comes to the Father except through me. No one comes to the Father except through me. I saw a thing where, where Oprah said one time, no, certainly not. There are many, many ways to God. There, now, there's a whole lot of paths that will take you to stand before God. She was right in that. But there is only one way that you will spend eternity with God. And that's through Jesus Christ and his sacrifice at Calvary. Uh, well, look, 1 Timothy 2, 5. For there is one God and there is one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. Look, we don't need a Pope. We don't need a Mary. We don't need any other idol or anything else to serve as a mediator or an intercessor between us and God. Jesus is the one and only mediator between God and man. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. And number three, we have seen his glory. This one's my favorite. We have seen his glory. Now the we that there, it refers to Jesus' first disciples. But it is the experience of all believers today. If you're a Christian, you have seen God's glory. It's really quiet in here this morning. I'm going to say that one more time and somebody say amen, okay? We have seen God's glory. Amen. Very good. What does it mean that we have seen God's glory? Well, John breaks it down for us. Look, we've seen the glory of his person. That's first. We have seen the glory of his person. Look, John the Baptist cried out, as is recorded for us here in verse 15 in the text it's regarding Jesus. It says, this was he of whom I said, he who comes after me ranks before me because he was before me. Now, now wait a second, you might be thinking. John was born before Jesus. We know this already. John's over here turning flips and whatnot, right? Y'all remember that in the womb? Some of you mamas might have thought your baby was doing that at some point. But, and, we, and we know this, that John the Baptist's ministry, that it began before Jesus. But here's the thing. What John the Baptist knows, as well as the apostle John, is that Jesus was in the beginning. And also, as awesome as John the Baptist was, he insisted that the person of Christ, that Jesus Christ, was far more glorious than he It'd be pretty hard to find a greater spiritual leader than John the Baptist. Um, John the Baptist walked in here and wanted to be your pastor this morning. You ought to kick me up the road right quick. Luke 1.15 says of John that he will be great before the Lord. He will be great before the Lord. And that listen to this right here. He will be filled with the Holy Spirit even from his mother's womb. Man, because that ain't what happens with us, is it? We're filled with the Spirit at the moment of, uh, or we're, 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 we're given the, the Holy Spirit at the moment that we become Christians, right? That, that, that regeneration, that conversion, it all happens at once. We're, we, we're, um, we, we're regenerated, we, 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 we exercise faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, and, and, and the Holy Spirit comes upon us. Like all, you know, there's argument regarding, you know, when, how those things happen, the ordering of things, but it's like... All of it at one time. John the Baptist was filled with the Holy Spirit from his mother's womb. Not just received the Holy Spirit, was filled with the Holy Spirit from the womb. 
He would, he would grow up and he would call Israel to repent and to be baptized. He was a man of tremendous courage. We know that. Uh, he, he was the one that confronted uh, King Herod. But, but listen, as one of my favorite sayings goes, the best of men are men at best. The best of men are men at best. Folks are going to fail you. I'm going to fail you. If I haven't done it already, by golly, it's coming. Maybe this week. If you hang out with somebody long enough, they're going to let you down. That's because the best of men are men at best. E even the John the Baptist shows us this. You'll remember that there was a time when even John the Baptist seemed to maybe have a little bit of doubt in his heart. He, had two, uh, he uh, asked two of Jesus' disciples to ask him, um, are you the one who is to come or, or shall we look for another? Y'all remember that? But listen, Jesus stands alone, and he stands apart from any mere man. If not for any, some other reason, look, every person will fail us at some point because they're going to die, and they're not going to be for us here anymore. But Jesus' ministry was not ended by death. He, he rose from the dead, and he intercedes for us, and he will never let us down. That's why, church, with, with joy-filled hearts, that we can sing those words to these hymns that we sometimes forget. We just read them off of a screen. That's why we can sing that song, Whatever My Lot. That's why we can sing that. Do you know what that means? Whatever my lot, whatever uh, life brings to me, whatever the case is, whatever might happen, whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. It's well. My favorite line probably from any hymn ever, and I know my favorite is holy, 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 and I've told you that 46 times, but this might be my favorite line from any sermon or from any uh, hymn that I've ever heard before. Remember that? My sin, not in part, but the whole. My sin, not in part, but the whole. Oh, the bliss of this glorious thought, my sin, not in part, but the whole, all of it, is nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, oh, my soul. It's with that glorious truth, folks, that the answer to the question for those of us who know Jesus, the answer to that popular greeting, how are you? Or how's your mom and them, like they like to ask back where I'm from. I don't know how you spell that. How's your mom and them? I don't think it's got very many vowels in it, but the answer is never, ultimately, I'm okay. It's never, I'm okay. It's I'm okay. Because it is well, it is well with my soul. Why? Because we have seen the glory of Christ. We've seen the glory of his person, the glory of who he is. Second, we've seen the glory of his provision. We've seen the glory first of his, of his person. Next, we've seen the glory of his provision. Heads up, those of you that, that like this and like alliteration, I'm going to fail you on point three because I couldn't think of something that was right that began with a P at that moment. So it begins with an R, and we'll see if you can guess it before we get there. But second, we have seen the glory of his provision. Verse 16, look at it with me. For from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. Grace upon grace. Now look, there's actually two ways for that to be translated. Your Bible might say in front of you, grace for grace. And both of those are acceptable translations based on the, based on the original language right there. And they might have two different meanings, but they, ultimately they mean the same thing. One of them might mean God's favor that just keeps on piling up. Because that's what grace is. Grace is God's unmerited favor. Grace literally at its core means you don't deserve it. Grace is God's unmerited favor. Saw a dude um, that, I, uh, that I grew up with post on uh, Facebook um, a few weeks ago. Uh, said something to the effect of um, uh, some people deserve God's grace and some people don't deserve God's grace. That literally is the dumbest thing I've ever heard in my life. And I've heard some whoppers, but that one's terrible right there, boy. Now, I understood the sentiment of it, certainly. But grace, the definition of it is you do not deserve that. You have not earned it. 
answer is you can't earn it. It literally, the definition is God's unmerited favor. That's what God's grace means. And so there's a couple of them here. It, it can mean grace upon grace, it, or grace, uh, um, it means God's favor that keeps on piling up. Or the other uh, way that you can take that is the grace of God that you receive with each recurring need. Whichever, uh, whichever way you want to translate that, whichever one you have in front of you, they're both acceptable. Whatever the case is, the truth is still this, that Jesus supplies all the spiritual blessings that we need. We will always find that his grace is sufficient. I, I, love, that, uh, I love that little statement. Look, um, if you come to the point in your life where you realize that Christ is the only thing that you need, that his grace is all you need, you'll always have everything you ever wanted and everything you ever needed, right? We find that his grace is always sufficient. John's gospel, it goes on to record, and we've kind of looked at all that middle section now. We've been through verses, or through chapters 3, uh, and we're in the middle of, of round 13 right now. We'll be back in there next week. It goes on to record all these different examples of Jesus' ability, not only his ability, but also his willingness to provide. When the wine ran out at the wedding in Cana, remember that? Jesus provided wine. And look, not just any wine for you winos. Y'all remember that passage? Y'all love this one. Y'all love this bad boy. For those of you who remember the story, Jesus provided good wine, it says. Jesus provided the good stuff. And when a man had been lame his entire life, Jesus provided healing. Uh, when a crowd was hungry, he provided food. Uh, when a man was blind, he provided sight. When a man, man was dead, he provided life. Listen, all of those are not simple little examples of just God answering and Jesus providing for physical needs. Now, see, he certainly does that in accordance with his will, but it's much, much deeper than that, folks. All of those miracles, they point to what Jesus does for the souls of those whose faith is in him. Look, his grace is always sufficient. It's, it's always sufficient. I love Philippians chapter 4, but not for this, the same reason that a lot of other people uh, love Philippians 4.13 because they think it means that they can go do whatever they want and just claim Jesus is the reason that they're doing that and everything's going to come out successful. No, that's not what it means. Philippians 4.12, Paul talks about being content. He says, I've, 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 I've learned the secret. And remember there, he said, I've learned. I haven't always known this. He says, I've learned the secret to face in anything. Plenty and hunger, abundance and, and need. I've learned that. It's all about contentment, right? He had learned, Paul had learned that God's grace is always sufficient. Whatever situation we find ourselves in, I love what William Barclay says right here. And this is not a public affirmation of everything that that guy's ever said or taught, but this is what he says right here, and I love this. He says, we need one grace in the days of prosperity and another grace in the days of adversity. We need one grace in the sunlit days of youth and another when the shadows of age begin to lengthen. He says the church needs one grace in the days of persecution and another uh, when the days of acceptance are here. We need one grace when we feel that we're on top of things and we need another when we are depressed and when we're discouraged and when we are near to despair. Folks, our, our God is a God of hills and valleys. His grace is is sufficient for us wherever we find ourselves. Look, church, His grace is sufficient for you as a whole and individually. And the truth is, look, He stands ready to heap more and more grace upon you. He stands ready to do that. Even now. If we're addicted to anything, look, let it be grace. The, the unmerited favor of of God. Look, in, in the coming year, if you want something to quit or to start, become a grace addict this year. Now, what I mean by that is, is the fact that, look, so many of us, and it can happen to all of us, many of us have kind of maybe spiritually plateaued. We've had, we've had times of where we just maybe doubted God, and then there's been times where we were just on fire for the Lord. And a lot of those seasons have come and have gone for many of us, and we've kind of hit this kind of plateau where we're just kind of this even kilter. 
And, and what I mean by all of this is that we, 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 we've received maybe a certain amount of the grace of God, and we're not seeking for it anymore. But the truth is, he will, he will provide that. But listen, his will is that you would pray for it. His will is that you would pray for it. That you would pray that God would fill you with more of his spirit, that he would fill you with more of his power, and that he would, that, that, that he would fill you with more of his love. I talk about this with teenagers all the time, or rather I used to more than I do now. Look, you fill yourself with trash, guess what comes out? Trash. But when God fills you with grace, guess what comes out? His grace. We've seen the glory of his person. We've seen the glory of his provision, and again, I want to keep, uh, I want to be truthful with you, or keep good on my promise. The third one begins with an R. We have seen the glory of his revelation. I'm not talking about the book in the end where guys are trying to twist all around this sort of way and make a statement with what they believe is going on in the world right now and then go try to find something in the Bible to line up with it, which is what many guys are doing right now. We've seen the glory of his revelation, of his revealing himself. Look with me at verse 18. No one has ever seen God, the only God, who is at the Father's side. He has made him known. Look, all throughout the Old Testament, there's godly men and godly women who wanted to know God intimately, like I'm certain all of you want to do. They wanted to know God intimately, but, but, but just read 1 Kings. Solomon said that God dwelt in thick darkness. Y'all remember that? In that same book, in that same book of the Bible, you'll remember Elijah uh, talked about hearing a still, small voice. And, and Moses had a burning bush, but still, and we all joke about that all the time. Man, I'd really have loved to have a burning bush here right now to tell me what in the world I'm supposed to do. And Moses had a burning bush, but still, his greatest desire was to see God himself. And so he pleaded with God, God, show me your glory. And God tells him, well, you cannot see my face, for man shall not see me and live. God would later send his son. And Jesus has made God known. The, the word used there for made known is the word we get the verb exegete from. Now, that might be a kind of a big word uh, for some of us. It, uh, it doesn't fit too well with me either sometimes. I had to understand what it means to. To exegete just means to interpret. That, that's what my job is each week, to come before the Word of God, to do my very best uh, to interpret what it has for us, to pull the meaning out of the text. Look, our job as Christians is not to formulate some set of ideas and then to go look for something in the Bible that lines up with that. That is not being a faithful Christian. We read the Bible, we study the Bible, we seek to interpret the Bible the way that God wants us to do it, and then we live that out, we apply that to our lives. You know, one of the worst things that you can do as a Christian sometimes is, hey, you know what, I think I need to be less prideful. Let me go find some verses uh, that really have something to do with pride, something like that. That is not the way that God seeks to work in our lives. The way that he seeks to work in our lives is that we read the Bible and that we place, that we put that into work in our own lives. You know, it happens so much of the time. Like I was just speaking of Revelation. You can go to a Christian bookstore anywhere right now, and there's some uh, genius that has just come up to, and he's putting into place all these things that are happening right now. They got all things to say about, hey, this is America, and this is how they fit in with what's going on in the world right now. And they make it sound real good, but what they do is they go and they just try to think up this stuff, uh, and then they go back to the Bible instead of starting with the Bible as their starting place. To, to exegete is to take the scriptures as they are and to pull the meaning out of them, not to take what I already believe and try to find something in the Bible that aligns with that. What Jesus does is he exegetes for us. He interprets, he explains God to us. The, the truth is, folks, to know what God is like. We all say all, uh, very often, and man, I, ju I just want to know what God's like. Man, I'd love to know what God's like. People say that all the time. Look, all we need to do is study the Lord Jesus Christ. 
you look at the person of Jesus Christ and you look at his work and what he has done. We've got all these verses that we've studied throughout the Gospel of John in our time uh, together. We've even heard that this morning, that he is the exact imprint of his nature. If you want to know what God's like, look to Jesus. And question for you this morning, do, do you see the glory of God in, in the person and in the provision and in the revelation of Jesus Christ, who he has revealed himself to be in the scriptures? And then the second question. It is his grace flowing out from you to others. John says at the end of verse 14 this. We've seen his glory, glory as the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. Full of grace and truth. We can't ever separate those things, folks. Those two things always go together. Jump down to verse 17. For the law was given through Moses... Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Jesus reveals the grace and the truth of God. You know, I mentioned several ways earlier that the tabernacle symbolizes Jesus, but I left out a couple on purpose. One of them is this. The tabernacle is where sacrifices were made to atone for sin. Death is the punishment for sin. But in his grace and in his mercy, God has provided a sacrifice for our sin. Look, in Old Testament times, and we all know this, but we need to be reminded of this all the time. This is just quite simply the gospel. Uh, the, the, the old quote is, we need to be reminded of the gospel all the time because we forget the gospel all the time. We learn that we are saved by, by grace alone, through faith alone, but we forget that all the time, don't we? God has provided a sacrifice for our sin. In Old Testament times, bulls and sheep and goats, they would be slaughtered to bear the punishment for the sins of God's people. But those, all, those sacrifices, and we know this already, they all pointed to Jesus. Several weeks ago, when we were in John chapter 12, we looked at Jesus' statement that the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. By glorified, in a way Jesus meant crucified. To the world, uh, as that beautiful old hymn goes, the cross is uh, the emblem of suffering and shame. To the world, that's what the cross is. And when I say the world, uh, I mean those in this world who are not Christians. If you're a Christian, you're not of this world anymore. You're, you're, in, a, you're, in, a different, you're in a different bracket. But to the world, the cross is... Uh, the emblem of suffering and shame. It involved torture. It involved humiliation. It involved shame. And I think that's God's way of showing us the shame of our sin. But for the Christian, the cross is where we see the grace of God. It's where we see the glory of God. Look, when you look at the cross, what do you see? What do you see when you look at that thing? There, there's one hang... No, we can't see that right now. Just kidding. Poinsettias are in the way. But when you look at the cross, what do you see? I hope you see the place where your sins were put away once and for all. They were nailed to the cross and you bear them no more. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, oh my soul. I hope you see grace. Jesus reveals the grace of God. He reveals the truth of God. And there's one last feature of the tabernacle I'll share with you this morning. The tabernacle was the place where God's word was revealed. It's where God's word was revealed. Moses came there to receive God's word for the people, you'll remember. Now Moses, as we had talked about, he begged God to show him the glory of his face. And God answered Moses' prayer, but just like he always does, he does it in his own timing. Jesus Christ was the answer to that prayer. Jesus is the tabernacle where the word became flesh. And so today the, the word shines into our hearts as we read and as we hear the Bible. 
And so if we have seen the glory of God in the Lord Jesus Christ, and if we have received the grace of God as we have put our faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, let's love the truth of God's word so that we might glorify God in our lives. That's one of the many reasons, folks, that though over the past month I've talked to you about all the things I love about Christmas, I love all things Christmas. My eyes are a little tired this morning but I love all things Christmas. I, I, I even love the secular stuff that we have made Christmas out to be so long as our focus is where it needs to be at Christmas. I love Christmas trees. I love wreaths. I sure would like to just leave these wreaths up all year, but I love everything about Christmas. I, I loved my, my, my little girl waking me up at 3.56 yesterday morning. And I love that I'm not able to go back to sleep when I get woken up like that. And so we got up at 5.06, but never went back to sleep. And I loved uh, going upstairs. Surprised my boys. Usually they got to come in there and, Daddy, wake up. Daddy, wake up. Daddy, wake up. And I went on up the steps yesterday morning and got them up yesterday morning. And we came downstairs and we started opening presents and things about 5.06, 5.08 in the morning yesterday morning. That's right. We read, I forgot that part. I did sing to them. I did sing to them. I don't remember what I sang. But I woke them up. We came downstairs, piled in my bed. We read Luke chapter 2, went to the living room. I had a cup of coffee because you have to. We got all ready, rode to Lynchburg, went to my in-laws. We're there by 930. We're at my mama's house in Forest, Virginia uh, by 3 Got back in the car at 7.15, drove back last night. Usually Saturday night I look over my sermon. Didn't happen last night, Jack. I got up early this morning to look over it, but I love all parts of Christmas. But I tell you what my favorite part of Christmas is. Aside from our Christmas Eve service. I, I so love that. But it's those times where I just sit by myself and I read God's word. It's my favorite part. Because it's in his word that we see God and that we see our Savior and that we hear of our Savior and that we come to know the only Savior of the world. And I will never leave this out of a sermon <laughs> who was born of a virgin, who lived a perfect life, died a sinner's death, and was raised to free us from our sin. It's in the word that we behold the glory of his person. It's in the word that we, uh, that we see the glory of his provision, certainly in our lives, but we're reassured of it. When we don't know if he's going to, we're reassured that he is in his word. And we see the glory of his revelation, of who he is. May his, gross, his grace flow out of us and into the lives of others. Uh, as we close out one year, it's going to be 2022 when we come back together next Sunday. Let's bow together in prayer. With every head bowed and every eye, eye closed this morning, we're going to do something a little bit different uh, during our time of response. I want to invite each of you to remain seated this morning, to remain there with your head bowed and with your eyes closed. Um, and Jean is going to come, and she's going to lead our choir in a final song. And I'll just tell you, as you're there, sitting there in your seat in the quiet of this moment, that Jean and I did not plan this. I had not written this sermon yet, but she had several weeks ago selected a song for our invitation time, and it's simply called Jesus at the Center. And the words to the song, they are a prayer. And so I would like for each of you, if you would sit there where you are as this song is sung. If you would sit there with your eyes closed and your heads bowed, and I would ask you to listen to and consider the words of this song. I will be down front. And if there's something that the Lord is, is telling you to do this morning and you find yourself willing to do that, why don't you come and share that with me? Maybe you, you find yourself willing for the first time to believe the gospel this morning. 
And you want to tell me in this love and body of believers that you now desire to follow Christ. Maybe you did that before and maybe you've never been baptized and you would like to be baptized next Sunday as part of our baptism service. I would love for you to be a part of that. Maybe you want to officially become a part of this membership. Maybe you've been coming here and you've been attending and you weren't sure before that this is the church for you and your family, but now you know. And you would desire for your, you and your family to be members of our church family. I invite you to come and to make that decision this morning. That you would end 2021 and you would begin 2022 as a member, the newest member of Oakland Baptist Church. Maybe you'd like to come up and you'd like to have me pray uh, with you or for you, whatever the case might be. Let me encourage you not to tarry, but just to ask God what he would have you to do in this moment. And that you would be obedient. And that you would be obedient to what he's calling you to do. Father, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for sending your son. God, may he be the center of everything in this coming year for each of us. May he be the, the center of our lives. May he be the center of our church. May everything that we do individually and in, in families, God, and as a church body, may it be for his glory. In his glory alone. That others might come to know him. And that we in turn might also draw nearer to you. Father we love you. We praise you. It's in Jesus name we pray.
Amen. Amen. I've got someone to uh, introduce uh, all of you to. Well, actually, I think most all of you know him uh, by now, but he's over here writing frantically like he does on a, a, a whiteboard a whole lot of the time when I watch him. Uh, but this is Brother Richard. Richard is coming this morning. Richard has made the decision, would like to move his membership from the church that he used to come to to, to ours now. Usually they're taller than me. <laughs> Man, this is good stuff. Yeah, it feels good, doesn't it? Uh, but man, we're so excited to welcome uh, Richard Gibbsy. Come on up here for a second. You come stand by uh, Coach Richard. Richard is um, a field hockey coach. Uh, I, I think I met him uh, when uh, Gibbs started playing field hockey. Might have been the first time. Richard is Gibbs, and many of our other girls in this church is uh, field hockey coach. And um, man, he came to us. Uh, man, you've been here a while now. Uh, but he goes to Hughes Sunday School uh, class, and Hughes had a tremendous effect on him uh, as well. And, uh, man, we're just excited. Uh, Richard has chosen to come and to be a part of our fellowship. So that, let's thank the Lord together. <laughs> and we're going to uh, show you here in just a minute what we do with folks like you. Um, <laughs> and by folks like you, I mean people that have decided to join our fellowship because uh, we've got a vote on another one I'm not too sure about this morning because we didn't get to last week. Uh, but Zach, you come stand right here. Why don't you come stand over here by Richard because we've got a vote on Zach here in just a minute that we didn't get to do last week. But we're going to do this to you next week, man, so you better study up, all right? Um, but no, we're so excited that, uh, that he's here and the, way, the, the unique set of circumstances that the Lord used in, in bringing uh, him here. Gibbsy loves her some Coach Richard, so man, we're excited. Uh, that uh, he is here. But um, before we move along, uh, let's vote on Zach so I don't forget this. He was out last week, um, but we need, to, we need to do this thing. I'm not, uh, I suppose I need to ask someone. Uh, let's see. Nervous? No. I'm just trying to figure out what I usually say. I didn't forgot. Um, do we have a motion to receive Pastor Zach uh, as one of our members here at Oakland Baptist Church? <laughs> um, do we have any discussion that needs to take place? Uh, do we have a second? All right, all those in favor, symbolize by saying amen. amen. Any opposed? Certainly not, right? Welcome, brother. We are going to do that with Richard uh, next week. But before you leave this morning, why don't you do me a favor? Why don't you come on up here this morning uh, and welcome Richard? Uh, tell him how glad you are uh, that he is here and what, uh, how glad you are what the Lord uh, is doing. Uh, a couple of other things before we leave. Richard, you can sit by Hugh for a minute, brother. Um, and uh, those of us with the, this length legs, we get tired on our legs quicker maybe. So you have a seat uh, for just a minute. Zach, you got a bulletin? Uh, I was right okay. You took notes today? Is that a boy? Yeah. Who's got a bulletin I can borrow right quick? Let's look at our birthdays this week and uh, wish each other happy birthday who have them. Drake Bonner has got a birthday today, so you'll want to wish him well. Brother Jerry Walters has got a birthday tomorrow. Uh, Tom Worley's got one this week as well, doesn't he, Miss Doris? The 28th. The 28th, yep. Jonathan Warner um, has got one on the 29th. And who else has got one this week? Reagan, you got a birthday this week? All right, I won't ask you any more after this year, but how old are you going to be? Seven. Happy birthday, Reagan. Look, I still remember when I think you were turning five that year, and you could have went to children's church, but you sat in here all day so I could tell you happy birthday, didn't you? You listened to me. You deserved a happy birthday. So happy birthday to you and all of those of you that had birthdays or have birthdays this week. Anyone else have a birthday this week that I missed? Oh, we didn't add the Januarys on there. The birthday list is in your bulletin, but I didn't make that until after uh, we had uh, done the bulletin one. So let's see. Joyce, you got a birthday. Yes, ma'am. Happy birthday, Miss Joyce. And Terry McDaniel's got one as well. Any others? Anniversaries this week. Who's got an anniversary? George and Liz, y'all got one, don't you? How many years is it, George? Fourteen. Happy anniversary. <laughs> did Liz remind you before you came to church today? You did that on your own, didn't you? Yeah, man, you remembered good, didn't you? Hot dog. Any other anniversaries this week? Any other anniversary? Well, let's stand together and prepare to be uh, dismissed and sent off. Um, as a reminder this morning, as we've been being reminded of this past week, and as those signs will remind you when you leave here, you're entering the mission field. 
And so wherever it is that you find yourself this week, uh, may you be faithful uh, to, uh, to uh, not only um, walk the walk, but to uh, talk the talk this week uh, as you faithfully share the gospel with those that you come into contact with. Um, Pastor Zach, if you will, brother, we will lead. Uh, Miss Jean, if you will start with the doxology. Brother Jimmy Browders, our deacon of the week. thank you for allowing us to come to your house and praise and worship you this morning lord lord you know christmas was yesterday and uh you know a lot of people getting presents and all that stuff but lord let us take the message we got today which is a gift and be able to move forward next year you know when we look at that cross the pastor was telling us to look at it what do we see it's a reminder that god gave his only begotten son to die for our sins. Let us take the gift of that message and carry it to our family, our friends. Oh, Lord, we ask you to be with us as we go home today. And everybody have safe journeys. We also ask you to also be with the ones that couldn't make it here today, Lord, the ones that are homebound, and be with them. We ask this in all your name. Amen. Amen. 